Hello children, this is Grandma Carla, and we are reading Freddy Goes Camping, and we are getting very close to the end of the book. This book is by Walter R. Brooks, and we are reading chapter 19. Jinx's report at breakfast time was a very favorable one. Mr. Anderson had tried to take a nap in the lounge, but the cricket treatment soon drove him out. He went to his car and tried for half an hour to get it started. Then he looked under the hood, and I never heard anybody say such things about anybody as, did, as he did about you, Freddy, said Jinx. He's pretty sure you did it, and he's coming down here this morning. You'd better be ready to duck. We'll be ready for him, said Freddy. What happened after he gave up trying to start the car? He was so sleepy that he could hardly stand up. He stumbled around and sort of collapsed in one of the chairs on the porch. The crickets were hollering good. But I guess he was so tired that he went to sleep anyway. Jinx grinned maliciously. He looked real cute, so sort of innocent and unprotected. I thought maybe if I sing him a little lullaby, he'd rest better. Wow, he liked to went through the ceiling. Of course, I was pretty close to his ear. I didn't want him to miss any of my clear bell-like tones. So then he staggered in to get his pistol. But Homer and the mice found it in the drawer yesterday. And they also found an open pot of glue that the carpenter had been repairing something with. So they sort of put two and two together and poured the glue over the pistol. Jinx laughed again. Anderson felt in the drawer and got his hand on the pistol all right, but it took him 10 minutes and practically his entire vocabulary to get it off again. The glue had only partly set. Golly, said Freddy, what an awful night. I kind of feel sorry for the poor man. Well, I don't, said the cat. Don't forget, he was going to cheat us out of our homes just as he did poor Mrs. Fillmore and make beggars of all of us. And all we've done is cheat him out of a couple nights sleep. But you've got to let Jacob take over now. Noise won't keep him awake much longer. Where is he now? Mr. Camper asked. Wandering around here and there, he's so groggy that even the mice and Homer aren't afraid of him. Eek nipped his ear once and woke him. And then, when he dropped off again, Homer kind of slithered over his face. Boy, that got results. I don't think he likes snakes. He's out in the woods somewhere, but the squirrels are keeping up the good work. I think I hear him coming now, said Miss Minerva. And sure enough, up the path came Mr. Anderson. He stopped a little way off, leaning with one hand against a tree, and with his head, thrust forward, peered vaguely at them with red-rimmed eyes. He looked completely exhausted. Good morning, Mr. Anderson. Lovely day, isn't it? said Mr. Camphor. Mr. Anderson clenched his fist. He pulled himself together and strode towards them. You pig, he said thickly to Freddy. What did you do to my car? Freddy glanced inquiringly inquiringly at Mr. Camphor, and Mr. Camphor nodded slightly. Their look said that they were agreed that the time had come for a showdown, for they both knew that although their plan had been to get him so mad that he would do something completely foolish, he was really too exhausted to be mad now. Indeed, they could use his exha exhaustion better if they could perhaps, then they could perhaps have used his anger. Freddy stood up. I disconnected a lot of things, he said boldly. Why? 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 Mr. Anderson shouted hoarsely. Because I'm going to put you where you belong, behind prison bars. That's why. How are you going to prove that I did it? Freddy asked. Fingerprints? But I haven't got fingers, only trotters. He held them up. You've admitted in front of witnesses, said Mr. Anderson. I guess that will be enough proof. 
But only, Miss Minerva said, if the witnesses heard him say it. We didn't hear anything like that, did we, Jimson? Certainly not, said Mr. Camphor. So that's the way it is, said Mr. Anderson. You're all in it together. That's it, said Mr. Camphor. Quite illegal. If you can prove it, just as your scheme to get this hotel and later to get my house and the bean farm was also quite illegal. We couldn't prove it either, but now your rats have been driven off. Your ghost scheme has exploded and it's our turn. How do you like it? And then Mr. Anderson's temper flared up and his self-control weakened by lack of sleep vanished entirely. I'll show you how I like it, he roared, and he started for Mr. Camphor. But Miss Minerva, who had been scrubbing out the frying pan, got up and stood in his way. One side, woman, he shouted. I wouldn't like to strike a lady. I wouldn't like to strike a gentleman, said Miss Minerva, but I guess there's no danger of that. And as he tried to brush past her, she lifted the frying pan and brought it down with a loud dong on the top of his head. At another time, the blow wouldn't have bothered Mr. Anderson much, but his head was already swimming with exhaustion, and the shock of it was just enough to make him completely dizzy. He staggered, turned half around, and then fell flat on his face. Dear me, said Miss Minerva. She looked with surprise at the frying pan and then set it down gingerly on the ground. Mr. Anderson shook his head two or three times and then got up slowly to his feet. You'll regret this, ma'am, he said. You'll regret it all your life. Yes, she said. I expect I shall. I'll regret I didn't hit harder. Sit down, Anderson, said Mr. Campfer sternly. I'll get you some coffee. We want to have a talk with you. Well, I don't want to talk to you, Mr. Anderson said. Why, confound you, you silly little red-headed donkey. Don't you think you're going to make any terms with me? I'll smash you. And he stopped abruptly as Miss Minerva again picked up the frying pan. Yes, I think we can make terms with you, said Mr. Camphor. Listen to me. We have prepared a paper here, and you are going to sign it. Ha, huh, don't make me laugh, said Mr. Anderson. We're not trying to. We're just trying to see that you don't sleep until you've signed it. You know that you won't get any sleep here at Lakeside. But I suppose you think that you can spend your nights in your home in Centerboro. So you can, but you won't sleep there either. We have by no means exhausted all of our method. We have by no means exhausted all of our methods of keeping people awake. Crickets can get into your house as easily as they got into the hotel. And there are doorbells that can ring, telephone bells in the middle of the night, mice gnawing in the woodwork. We have a hundred means at our disposal. Here, wake up, for Mr. Anderson's head had fallen forward on his chest. You have a very soothing voice, Mr. Camper, said Freddie. And then, as Mr. Anderson gave a long, comfortable snore, hi, Jacob, he called. There was a droning buzz, and the wasp list lit on Mr. Anderson's collar. Thanks, pal, he said. Where do you want me to begin drilling? You got any preference? You pick your own spot. Jacob took out his sting and polished it on his coat collar, then walked up onto Mr. Anderson's neck and looked all around with a professional air. I always like this spot, just below the ear, he said. The nose is more spectacular, but in the long run, the neck gives the best results. Well, here we go. And he drove the sting in. The results indeed were excellent. Mr. Anderson's snore turned into a screech, and he leaped up, clawing at his neck. He danced around for a moment wildly, then clasping his neck in both hands, dropped down on a log and stared up at them balefully under drooping eyelids. You see, said Mr. Campfer pleasantly, no signature, no sleep. He held out a paper, and after a moment, Mr. Anderson took it with a grunt and started to read. 
Halfway through, he started up. Do you think I'm crazy, he said? Why, this thing, you could jail me on it anytime you wanted to. Quite right, said Mr. Camper. But we won't, if you behave yourself. We will give it back to you when you have given the hotel you stole back to Mrs. Fillmore. Oh, yeah? Mr. Anderson's face twisted in an unpleasant sneer. His whole expression now betrayed how dishonest he really was, for he was too tired to keep on playing the part of the bluff, Ge of the bluff, genial good fellow who most of Cinderborough's people thought he was. Give it back, eh? I paid good money for that hotel, and and Miss, Mrs. Fillmore will pay it back to you, Mr. Kem Camper interrupted. Less, of course, what it costs to repair the damage that you've done. Say, $3,000. Mr. Anderson was again peering at the paper. Listen to this, he said. I confess that I did felonously, and with malice aforethought. Scare, frighten, and terrify the employees of said hotel, to the end that they might and subsequently did flee in terror and consternation, and that I furthermore, in pursuance of my criminal and iniquitous machinations, why, I don't even know what this means. Mr. Camper smiled, a self-satisfied smile. I thought I worded it rather well, he said. Hey, Mr. Anderson's head had begun to droop again. Mr. Camper seized his shoulder and shook it. Wake up! Sign this paper! Mr. Anderson roused slightly and held up a groping hand for the pen that Mr. Camper put into it. He signed, and then he fell off the log onto his back and went to sleep. Mr. Camper tucked the copy of the paper into the sleeper's pocket with the note at the bottom saying that the original would be turned over to the district attorney within three days unless Mrs. Fillmore had brought back Lake, had bought back Lakeside for $3,000. That'll fix it, Mr. Camper said. He'll know when he wakes up and looks at the paper that he's got to return the, t the hotel or go to jail. It didn't take long to break him down, said Freddie. I thought we'd have to keep him awake for a week. Those big men, said Mr. Camper complacently, they just can't take it. Nonsense, said Miss Minerva. He broke down because he knew he had done a wicked thing. And if he'd been in the right, you'd never have gotten him to sign. She looked down at Mr. Anderson, who was sleeping as peacefully as a baby, with his head in the ashes of last night's fire. The ashes blew up in, a little, in little gray clouds as he breathed. What are we going to do with him? Let's get the carpenters to take him home, said Freddie. We don't want him here, cluttering up the scenery any longer. Where's the carton? I'll have to go round up the bugs and take them and Homer and the mice back to the farm. And then he hesitated. Well, are we going to break up camp now? He looked around regretfully at the shelters and the beach and the fireplace. Why should we, said Mr. Camper. We haven't had much fun yet on our camping trip. I don't want to go home yet either, said Miss Minerva. Oh, that's wonderful, said Freddie. Then if Bannister can drive us down to the farm, I can come back again. Mr. Bean looked curiously at Freddie when Bannister drove the animals into the barnyard. It was plain that he was anxious to know what had happened, but it was against his principles to ask any animal questions. Freddie explained this to Bannister, so the butler brought Mr. Bean up to date while Freddie ran off to tell Mrs. Wiggins. Mrs. Wiggins and her sisters were delighted, but they had one disquieting bit of news. The rats had escaped during the night. However, Uncle Solomon had sighted them shortly before midnight, traveling steadily south. I don't think we have to worry about them, Freddie, said the cow. They couldn't do anything alone against us. I don't believe we'll ever see them again. Freddie said that he hoped so and went back to the waiting car. Mr. Bean was leaning on the car door, talking to Bannister. Beside him on the ground were several cartons and a large package. When Freddie came up, he reached out and he patted the pig's head. This pig, Bannister, he said, is a fine pig. Mrs. Bean and I are very fond of this pig. He's smart, 
as a whiplash. Bannister, going camping with Mr. Camphor, you tell me? Well, I was down to Cinnaboro yesterday, and I saw some things in Busy Bee I thought might be good for him to have. Couldn't figure out which one he'd like best, so I bought the whole kit and caboodle. You can just leave them in the back there. Oh, Mr. Bean, Freddy began, but Mr. Bean turned his back on him and said to Bannister, Get along with you now, and he walked into the house. Back in camp again, Freddy undid the packages. The big package was a tent, just like the ones that the rats had destroyed. In the cartons was everything imaginable for camping. Nested cooking utensils, a small axe, a little pressure kerosene stove, a compass, a hunting knife in a sheath, a camera, a pair of binoculars, everything anyone could possibly want. One day, about two weeks later, Miss Minerva and Freddie were out fishing in the canoe. Mr. Camphor had gone to Lakeside to help Mrs. Fillmore hang curtains. The hotel was to open again the 1st of June. The camp had now taken on the look of a permanent camp, for Mr. Camphor had decided that he liked living there better than he did in the big house across the lake. Miss Minerva, who now required only two compliments a day, three on rainy days, to keep her from getting cross, agreed that she liked it better too, though later in the season she might stay for a while at Lakeside, where she had spent so many happy summers. Even Bannister had finally come over to stay. Mr. Camper hadn't wanted him at first. He said that he didn't need any dignity out in the woods. But when Bannister agreed to be as undignified as possible while in camp, Mr. Camphor let him come. Today, Bannister had paddled over to get the mail and some supplies. Miss Minerva had just landed a good-sized perch, and Freddie was ta taking it off the hook for her when he looked up and he saw the butler's canoe approaching. He wasn't surprised to see Jinx sitting up in the bow or one or of the other of the farm animals was always coming across to spend a day or two at camp. But this time, Jinx called out to him, Come ashore! I've got a message for you! It was a letter that the cat had, and this is what it read. Mr. Frederick Bean, President, First Animal Bank of Centerboro, Editor, Bean Home News, Stony Point, Jones Bay, Lake Atasarga, 45, New York. Dear Sir, at a meeting of the depositors of the First Animal Bank, it was unanimously agreed to pass a vote of censure directed against you for neglecting your financial duties by closing the First Animal Bank without warning and keeping it closed for three weeks to the great detriment and disgust of said depositors. It was further agreed that in the event that you do not return pronto, the committee for the depositors will combine to form an independent bank to be known as the Bean Trust and Fidelity Company and will endeavor by all means in their power to take your banking business away from you. This they will undoubtedly be able to accomplish as everybody is sick of waiting for you to come back. At a later meeting of the subscribers to the Bean Home News, a vote of censure was proposed and passed against you for the neglect of editorial duties in that no issue of the Bean Home News has appeared for three weeks. A committee headed by Mr. J.J. Pomeroy is now drafting plans for an independent newspaper to be known as the Rural Animal Intelligencer which will be written entirely in verse. Huh, said Freddy. J.J.'s two lines of poetry is going to his head and will be distributed free. Yours faithfully, J.J. Pomeroy, for the committee. Well, I'll be darned, said Freddy. Written on my own typewriter, too. What's there to this, Jinx? Are they really sore? Oh, not really. But it is a nuisance, not having the bank open. Hank and I wanted to go to the movies night before last, and Hank had to borrow the money from Mrs. Bean. 
quite upset him. You know how shy she is. I suppose you couldn't have, you couldn't have borrowed it. Sure I could have, but I've taken Hank three or four times, and has he ever taken me once? No, not once. I just told him it was time that he did something about it. Freddie said, well, to get back to this letter, who wrote it? Charles drafted it. Lots of nice words in it, aren't there? I thought I recognized his fine Italian claw, said Freddie. Written in Italian, eh, said Jinx. Guess that's why I couldn't understand more than half of it. Oh, sure, I read it on the way over. I knew you wouldn't mind. Here's a word now, censure. What's that mean? I don't know exactly, said Freddie. I guess it means, oh, I don't know. I guess a vote of censure is the opposite of three loud cheers. Well, I'd better go down. Mr. Camper, who had come back from the lakeside and was sitting on a log looking at his mail, now called to Freddie. Hey, look at this. It was a picture postcard, a photograph of a little tumble-down hut which stood on the edge of a muddy-looking stream. All about stood huge, forbidding-looking trees, their branches draped in tattered black rags of moss. Everything looked damp. There were two alligators on the mud bank beside the house, and a written under it were these words, having a terrible time, glad you are not here. Everything awful. Very happy. Your loving Aunt Elmira. Can you beat it, said Mr. Camphor. We did everything possible for her. Talked cheerfully to her. Waited on her. And she goes and lives in a swamp. I've been thinking about it, said Freddie. You were nice to her, all right. But being nice to people, well, I guess it's giving them what they want instead of what we think that they ought to want. Yeah, said Jinx. Well, the boys want the bank open. How about it, pig? So Freddie said goodbye to the campers and promised to come back for a day or two anyway, and maybe longer as soon as he'd gotten things straightened out at home. And then he and Bannister and Jinx set out in the canoe. Freddie looked back mournfully at the camp as it got gradually smaller and smaller. On the road to Jones's Bay, he thought, it is, it is always bright and gay. No, no good. Then he thought, gracious, if I've got to get out an issue of the paper tomorrow, I'd better get busy. Let's see, there ought to be a poem, maybe another one in the series about the features. Hmm, and he got out his notebook. And as always, in the pleasure of composition, he forgot his sadness. This is what he wrote. The features. Number five. The ears. The ears are two in number. And beside the head on either side, one to the left and one to the right, they are attached extremely tight. Their purpose is twofold, to wit, to give the hat a place to sit, so that it will not lose its place and slipping down engulf the face. Also, to ventilate the brain when heated by great mental strain, by standing at angles, right angles out to catch whatever winds about, or when the summer breeze is napping to substitute by gently flapping. Do not therefore attempt to pull the ears from off the parent's skull. Though ears look odd and out of place and add so little to the face, though, an orna though as adornment they're lamentable, without them you'd be unpresentable. And he who rashly grabs the shears will find too late with bitter tears that there's just no substitute for ears. There, said Freddie, my goodness, it's nice to be in the harness again. And that is the end of Freddy Goes Camping. Now let's look at the last pictures there. This was a really delightful story, wasn't it? There's poor Mr. Anderson. And there's Jinx the cat. And I think that the wasp is just 
about ready to sting him, but I don't see the wasp in the picture. But they were determined to keep Mr. Anderson awake. Oh dear, there's the picture of the frying pan being placed on Mr. Anderson's head. And it says she lifted the frying pan and brought it down with a loud dong. Miss Minerva always gets her man with the frying pan. And I believe that is the last little picture. This was an awfully long chapter. And that is the end of our book. And hang around because I've got another Freddy book that's going to be started shortly. This is Grandma Carla, and I love you.